Hi, good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Cannon and I have the honor of being the head of school at Ramaz. Um, this week we read the Torah portion of Lech Lecha and it begins <coughs> with the famous words, Vayom HaShem al Avram, Lech Lecha me'art secha o mi moladetecha o mi beit avicha al ha'aretz asher areka. What God is saying to Avram, Go from the land, from your birthplace, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Essentially, it's the ultimate statement of I'll take you from where you are and you're going to go to another place that I'm not able to tell you about. And uh, or I'm not going to tell you about. You have to discover. And I think there couldn't be a more apt way for something to be read on the Shabbat before this election as go, go from your place that you know to somewhere that you are completely unfamiliar with. There is a uh, probably one of the highest levels at the moment of distrust in government um, of all parties. People are very unsure what the polls um, will mean or what they're saying. People are really unsure what next Tuesday will bring. Um, I'm not an expert. We are surrounded by experts who can talk about where this election fits in um, in terms of history, but we know for sure that it's very consequential. It's consequential for how COVID will be managed. It's consequential for race relations. It's uh, consequential for the economy. It's consequential for us as, as Jews in different ways, the relationship of religion and politics, um, and also, of course, different outlooks on Middle East peace. Um, I'm not going to address those. I just want to address one Ramaz priority for me and I know for all of you. And that is that in this very noisy, aggressive world, uh, we value civil discourse. We value the ability to listen and learn and to grow and to be better people through our understanding of one another. And I don't think that there could be a better way of accomplishing that than to listen very carefully to views with which we agree, but more importantly to views with which we disagree, so that we can understand the perspectives of where people come from respectfully and thoughtfully. And I'm thrilled that we're able to present you with this opportunity um, to do that today. I'm going to hand the proceedings to Dr. Jacoby, but just in saying the Probably one of my highlights of, uh, of this few weeks was the five minutes before you all came on, where people were happily recalling their eighth grade papers that they'd done for Dr. Jacoby and also remarks that he'd written and feedback. That's the, that's the mark of an extraordinary teacher. We're honored to have you in the school, Dr. Jacoby, and it's my pleasure to hand over to you for today's proceeding. Thank you. Uh, make sure my mic is on. And it is, yes. Uh, I've been watching, participating in, and thrilled by American presidential elections since 1952, 68 years ago. To this day, I feel there's something majestic about this huge, diverse people pausing to choose their governing officials to carry out our wishes. The United States invented the representative political party system based upon the custom that no person, no party, has a monopoly on truth, patriotism, and legitimacy. That custom, as Mr. Cannon alluded to, is being sorely challenged these days. Today, you'll hear from four Ramaz alum representing diverse opinions, joined by four Ramaz students of equally diverse opinions. We hope you'll find their remarks and discussion informative. Equally importantly, we hope you will learn the value of respectful, honest, civil conversation that they will no doubt model. So now let's begin. And uh, I, I welcome you all. I'm not going to spend time with the specific uh, resumes introducing you. The students and the audience can read about that in the materials that we sent out but it's, it's wonderful to have you all here and good to see you again. So I'm, I'm gonna um, start with this issue that's been raised uh, by both Mr. DeCannon and myself and uh, ask you, has there ever been in your experience or in your scholarly education, uh, an election like this since, shall we say 1860, the eve of the civil war? And I'm going to turn to Mr. Desnick.
I think my microphone is now on. We've overcome the first Zoom challenge uh, to having a civil discourse. Always Although, a tense moment. Yes, and if, if you do need to use the mute button, please do. Um, you know, we have to maintain a semblance of control. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, I think that there are unique ways in which there is more tension now than ever before. And what I would point to just in the, you know, 30 to 40 years of elections I've experienced myself is the way that people here in Washington, where I live and work, are judging each other based on their partisan differences. Um, you may have seen a handful of articles in the press about how rare uh, bipartisan marriages are becoming. I happen to be in one and it hasn't been a challenge. Um, but, you know, I, more and more uh, colleagues on one's own side of the aisle or even on the other side of the aisle, if one doesn't condemn something or support something vociferously enough, one does become suspect. I mean, so I worked on John McCain's presidential campaign full time in 2008, and it wasn't an issue for the, you know, majority of friends and colleagues and relatives I have who are Democrats. They, they, they honored that. It wasn't a problem. I supported Romney in 2012. And I happened to be a, a Republican who did not support the current president in 2016. And, but I could also tell you, even if I didn't test it directly, that there, was, there are people who, even if they can restrain themselves to some extent, if they know you uh, are supporting this president, they judge you as a person. It's not merely a political difference. It's, it's something about your character. And I, I hope we can avoid that. Um, I mean, we do have to form judgments of others' characters, but hopefully one vote shouldn't be enough to do it. We should, you know, whoever it is, whoever it's your classmates, don't stereotype them as, oh, I can't believe they're a Trump supporter. Oh, they're so woke. They, you know, they have to define their pronouns anew each Monday. Um, it, it's really important to step away from that, to see that people change and grow over time. And as Mr. Cannon said, civil discourse really is the foundation. Mr. Marins, you want to speak up to this issue? unprecedented election? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, I I think the the first real election that I can, that I felt like I was uh, even somewhat informed was probably about 2000. Y you know, I, I sometimes think it's overstated, uh, to be honest with you. I, I remember the tense moments in 2004 uh, during the uh, re-election fight over Bush. I was a student at Ramaz and at the time, I certainly felt like it was very difficult to, to speak up against uh, the war on terror and, and wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and so the, the, I think that there was less uh, sort of, there weren't street brawls between uh, left-wing activists and right-wing activists the way that there are and politically motivated attacks uh, the, the way that there are now. But I can think of times that, that were tense, just maybe not for as broad a swath of the population. Speaking as somebody who works at a liberal publication, HuffPost, I will say, though, that uh, this political polarization that we're experiencing right now in the country has its own unique impact within the sort of broad center-left democratic and far-left tent, in that there are very, very intense debates over who is to blame for Trump's election, uh, over uh, what is an adequate uh, sort of uh, ideological commitment to, to racial justice on the one hand, to economic justice on the other. And it can be every bit as tense and polarized as the debate between left and right. And of course, it's supercharged and dumbed down in many ways by the way news and, and little bits of information it gets distorted and ricocheted through both social media and, and of course, cable TV news. So I'm not prepared to, to use a, you know, a superlative about exactly uh, what this election, where this election ranks in terms of divisiveness and its consequentialness. Uh, I, I, I agree that there has never been a president in, in my lifetime who has been quite so inflammatory and, and really prejudiced toward uh, groups within the United States. And I agree that I have not seen in my lifetime um, uh, this kind of uh, ideologically motivated violence. But I do remember a pretty, pretty chilly climate in the 2000s, for example, after 9-11. Okay, I'm going to move down the list. I, I will point out, I can't help doing it, that Mr. Marins could not help but agree. But um, uh, I, that's not quite the way I stated the question. Uh, I, I just said unprecedented. But you certainly got in your own opinion there about the 
present president and you, what you remarked as inflammatory behavior. Thank, thank you. Um, Mr. Reynas, uh, the uh, unprecedented nature, what is your feeling about this? You're going to have to unmute, or I can unmute you. There you go. Hi, first off, thank you for having me. I wish we were all together, uh, mostly because I've been curious about walking in the hallways since. Um, I, this is certainly the worst election since 2016. Uh, I think going back before that, look, my first vote was in 1988 when George Herbert Walker Bush was running against uh, Mike Dukakis, a name that probably does not resonate through the hallways of Vermont. Um, I've become a little bit more familiar with elections beforehand, not to the extent of uh, a historian, but I have been trying to look. I I'll say this, I'm going to agree and disagree um, with the two previous answers. First, um, you know, I worked for Al Gore in 2000. I started work for Hillary Clinton in 2002. My um, ideology is not well hidden, but I'll say this. You know, in 2000, uh, 2004, 2008, as recently as a decade ago, um, I was as likely to have a Republican close friend as a Democrat close friend. I was more than likely to agree with my Republican friends, more than my Democratic friends. When I worked in the Senate for Hillary, we worked with Republican senators all the time. I don't even know. Uh, when I decided I was a Democrat, uh, it really just sort of happened. I'm sure a lot of you are growing up in Republican households, Democratic households, but at some point in the next few years, you might decide that you want to call yourself something else or nothing. But um, the idea that, that politics is getting worse is absolutely true. But what we've seen with Donald Trump is an absolute just throwing accelerant on uh, a fire. And it's, uh, it's disingenuous to say it's a continuum of, of that trend because a few things. First off, I would have been more than, it, it, I voted for Barack Obama. I worked for Barack Obama. I'm happy he won re-election. If Mitt Romney had won, I would have gone on with life. I wouldn't be railing on Twitter or standing in front of the White House with a bullhorn because Mitt Romney is a good person. And George Bush, I didn't agree with most of what he said, but there's a difference here. I never doubted that any of the presidents in my lifetime of either party woke up every day deciding to try to do what was best for the entirety of the country. Now, chances are half the country disagreed with them, but I did not question that, whether it was Bill Clinton or George Bush this is the first president we've had in a long time that wakes up and really just doesn't care about somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of the country. And that's really problematic. And that has accelerated um, a problem that Donald Trump is a symptom, um, but that doesn't mean he's an innocent. And it's funny, you know, the admonition to have civil discourse Usually that comes from the top. The reason it's so hard to have civil discourse is because the President of the United States doesn't try to have civil discourse. So we're all trying to exist in a, uh, in a framework that is, you know, from the, from the old days. Um, and win or lose next week, we are in a problem. Um, and, you know, talking about 2004 and the the attacks by the Bush campaign against John Kerry, what was then called Swift Boats, which you can look up, now seems quaint in hindsight. And I hope for a decade from now or a generation from now that we are not looking at 2016 and 2020 as quaint as compared to where we are. So that's an incredibly long way of saying it's not just unprecedented, it's uniquely horrible and problematic and long lasting and will uh, succeed one human being. Thank you. M Mr. Troy, as, as the last one that I'm calling on in this particular round of questioning, what, I'm giving you a challenge. What I'd like you to do is both address my original question, but perhaps respond to what we just heard. Great, thank you, Dr. Jacoby. And uh, I'm actually a historian, uh, tra trained historian. And so when I hear the word unprecedented, 
I go look for historical precedents. That's just how I approach it. And that's what I learned uh, with Dr. Jacoby and when I was in his class many years ago uh, at Ramaz. And, and like uh, Philippe, my first election was also that uh, Bush Dukakis election. Uh, I think one of my daughters said to me the other day, uh, there's, she saw a picture of Dukakis. She said, who is this guy? I said, he actually ran for president. So sometimes these things recede into our historical memory. It was interesting that Dr. Jacoby started with 1860, uh, which of course was a very contentious election, so contentious that the country broke apart afterwards. And then I also think about the 1876 election, which was not only contentious, but a disputed election. Uh, it was the famous Tilden versus Hayes election. And that's the one that uh, unfortunately the deal that led to uh, Hayes <coughs> becoming president um, ended reconstruction. And then we saw the uh, terrible um, problems uh, in the South that continued after that. But so uh, we, we had these problematic elections in the 19th century, in the 20th century. Uh, 1932 was also very contentious. There were veterans marches on Washington during the, the depression and in one particularly horrible incident when uh, um, Hoover had the veterans areas cleared by the military, uh, which seemed to be close to civil war. Um, Franklin Roosevelt thought that he he won the election at that moment, and he was correct. He did, did win the election. Uh, you also think about the 1960 election it was very contentious, and uh, Richard Nixon decided not to uh, contest the votes in Illinois and Texas, which uh, I think was a smart move by him because that that also could have led to uh, potential separation. Then, of course, you had the 18 the 1968 election uh, when you had riots in the streets in Chicago, and people forget that in every year in the 1960s, there were urban riots in, in Lyndon Johnson's presidency. Every summer of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, there were urban riots. So there have been definitely contentious elections and problematic periods. Uh, that said, there are some really worrisome trends going on right now, the violence in the street. I think social media exacerbates things. Uh, I do think both parties uh, push towards the extremes and have incentives to do so. And I'd like to see more of a push towards the middle. And I would like to think, like Philippe was talking about, the um, uh, he wants uh, 19, 2016 and 2020 to be seen as quaint. Um, I would like us to look back, uh, or, or he doesn't want it to be seen as quaint. I would like to look back at the 2016 and 2020 elections and say, oh, well, that was a pretty bad time, but we've kind of normalized since then. And that, that is my sincere hope. So um, again, there are always precedents for problematic periods in American history. Uh, and there are definitely challenges that we face today. And I think uh, this kind of civil discourse is one way to hopefully get, get past it. But I would not go into the complete depths of despair and say that uh, as Ronald Reagan used to say for America, there's always a brighter day that lies ahead. Thank you. Um, since we, we've touched upon uh, the, uh, the atmosphere, the concerns, uh, what might happen in terms of the election, once the election actually takes place. Emmett, Mr. Adis, I'd like to actually turn to you and uh, have you ask your question about uh, the possibilities that we face with the election. Okay. Amidst the global pandemic, economic insecurity, divided government, racial and partisan strife, riots and looting, many Americans say that America has not been this divided in decades, if not centuries. Would America survive a contested election? So let's go in, uh, I'm gonna do this arbitrarily today, uh, reverse order. Uh, do you think that there might be a, a con contested election, legal contested election, Mr. Troy, and can we survive it? Yeah, so I, I think the odds of a contested election are lower than people think. It's kind of like um, the, uh, the open convention or the brokered convention, everyone, journalists always say, oh, it's gonna happen this year, it's gonna happen this year, and it, and it rarely does. So. Uh, that, that doesn't mean there aren't challenges and we may not know on election night. And uh, obviously uh, we have one incident in the last 20 years where we didn't know on election night and that went on for 36 days and it was clearly worrisome, but we, we did survive it. So I, I think we're likely to know on election night what happened as we are in most election nights. Uh, but even if there is a contested election, look, I, I believe in the American experiment. I believe in the, in the American idea. And uh, I know there's a lot of tension and uh, I was struck by what Ariel said earlier about um, uh, people are judging you uh, by, by where you are. And what Philippe said about, uh, I always had Republican friends in the past, but now it seems like people can't be friends of the opposite party. And I just wonder to what extent that is a New York, Washington phenomenon and how much is that, is that really going on in the, in the rest of the country? And uh, so I like to think that the great mass of the American people does not feel that way. And I would believe that we would survive a contested election, but Lord knows I do not want it to happen. And I hope we know on election night what happens. Ariel, do you see the chances? And I'm echoing uh, one of the members of the audience 
Mikhail Finkelstein. Uh, do you see the chances of actual um, serious civil unrest uh, in the aftermath of the election? Um, well, I think it's less than 50-50 odds, but those are not good numbers. If you're trying to avoid something very bad, you know, 50-50 is not too reassuring. But I mean, so first, I think it's important to contrast between civil unrest and a contested election, right? So I think those of us on the panel were all old enough to remember 2000, which was uh, contested, right? It was contested in the courts. Um, and in the end, there was actually... I was actually in the UK at the time, and they really were worried there, expressing in the papers, is this you know, the potential for an American breakup? And I, I was sort of perhaps complacent, but I felt, no, it'll go up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will decide and people will accept that. And I think that is what happened, that despite how much remaining anger there was over some of the particular decisions in Florida, that, that happened. Um, and, you know, there was jokes for four or eight years. So in 2004, there was the slogan, uh, redefeat Bush. But in general, I don't think there was that much of a challenge to Bush as the legitimate president. Um, and here, if we have violence, but I think perhaps even more what could drive it is the question of whether people truly be will believe that the outcome we decide on from you know, state board of elections or the courts is legitimate. And that's the real risk. Um, and I think that's what would drive uh, potential violence in the streets if people really feel my candidate won and you cheated me out of it. Um, you know. Perhaps the last precedent for that is what uh, Tevi raised in 1876. Um, there's always some people who feel a measure that, oh, it couldn't have really been that way. Like the famous statement, I think, from uh, Pauline Kael when uh, Nixon wiped out McGovern that, well, everyone I know voted for McGovern. How could that have happened? Uh, and of course, on the Upper West Side, things are a little different than the rest of America. And that's something we should talk about more. But so I think it's, I think there is a good chance. Um, I think I, I have a little more confidence in the polls and perhaps many people do that things will be decided that if it's a seven or eight point win for one side, uh, it's, it's answered on election night or within the next 48 hours. So it's possible, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And I'm gonna ask Daniel and then Philippe to briefly address the same issue from uh, Emma Davis. Yeah, so the question of a contested election is an interesting one. And one thing that I'm gonna be looking at is an issue in Pennsylvania that could come before the Supreme Court, which is whether absentee or mail-in ballots are acceptable if they are postmarked before election day or mailed before election day, but they arrive after election day because uh, the Supreme Court just ruled, uh, sort of upheld an appeals court ruling that a, an, an attempt to extend the deadline in Wisconsin to say, well, if it had been mailed before election day and it were, uh, if, it, and if for some reason, perhaps because of the, the difficulties that the Postal Service has been having, it arrived afterward, that it could not be counted. And, and the logic of Brett Kavanaugh, um, who, you know, who wrote um, uh, you know, the majority decision was that uh, uh, you, you need to know the outcome on election night or it, uh, it, it creates, uh, uh, to avoid the chaos and, and suspicions of impropriety that can ensue. Um, and you know, this is somebody who, performed legal work uh, in the Bush versus Gore case before the Supreme Court, which was just such a case where both Democrats and Republicans agreed that it was not decided on election day. So, um, but he's now endorsing the logic that it needs to be decided. So we have that decision already in Wisconsin. To go back to Pennsylvania, which I, I initially mentioned, uh, prior to Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation yesterday evening, the Supreme Court was deadlocked on whether to uphold a state Supreme Court ruling in Pennsylvania that effectively kept in place an extended deadline um, uh, that, that allowed these, uh, against the wishes of the Pennsylvania Republican Party, that allowed these, uh, that would allow these mail-in ballots to be counted after election day if they were, if they were uh, you know, if they were sent beforehand. Uh, that, um, the, the, uh, that state uh, policy was upheld by a 4-4 Supreme Court tie with Justice John Roberts, uh, essentially saying it's up to states to decide their election laws in this particular case. If, as Pennsylvania Republicans plan, they, they try to get this argued before the Supreme Court once again, um, you, you would need uh, Amy Coney Barrett to, to side with John Roberts, which, which seems unlikely, and you could potentially have a situation where 
a number of absentee ballots from Pennsylvania are thrown out if they're received after election day. That said, I think it is uh, probably unlikely, like everybody else said, uh, we're seeing polling that is well beyond the margin of error. We've seen a whole lot of early in-person voting, which uh, will be counted uh, sooner and, and not subject to, say, to the same challenges as mail-in voting. Uh, but uh, you know, anything's a possibility. The polling was uh, inaccurate in 2016. Though Biden is ahead in all the crucial states by a higher margin than Hillary Clinton was, so uh, a significantly higher one in, in, in many cases. So it would have to be really wrong. Uh, and then, and then, you know, to the issue of of sort of civil unrest in the streets, I, you know, I think it's unlikely, but I've been surprised by the degree to which it's occurred in the past few years. Uh, you know, I, I guess the advantage that the sort of uh, the political right has in this country is that generally. Uh, for all that there has been some, you know, sort of violence committed by people associated with Antifa or, um, uh, you know, kind of random uh, scattered looting and rioting, um, the portion of the country that, that owns more guns is generally more conservative. And uh, so if it were to go in a direction that disappointed liberals, um, I think, you know, it wouldn't take the form of like some kind of an armed insurrection. Uh, you know, I... I, I, I tend to think that Americans uh, are a lot of bark and not a lot of bite on this stuff. I mean, again, notwithstanding some of the incidents that we've seen in the past six months and in the past four years, uh, most people are much more content to scream from their keyboards. And uh, we do have a, you know, a relatively comfortable uh, consumer world and life right now. And, and I just, I, I find it hard. Right. hard Hard to be plausible, but uh, anything is possible, and, and I've certainly been surprised. Uh, so actually, you, something has been raised now in terms of these answers that, Philippe, maybe you could move on to address, and that is the role of the court. Um, specifically, what I'm asking you, and I'm going to turn to some others as well, is presidential candidate Biden, former Vice President Biden, has not indicated what position he'd take on the court. Do you think that the, uh, if the Democrats were to actually take control of all the branches of uh, the executive branch, the legislative branch, that they should, in fact, pack the court? Uh, should or should not aside, the Democrats won't. I mean, the Democrats just, I don't even know how to, I can't think of anything. The historians on the call can think of something. Uh, the last time the Democrats did something bold and really uh, overturned. I think the more likely question um, is when part of uh, the, the issue you're bringing up is whether they would get up the so-called filibuster, which um, allows for really any one senator um, to stop everything once you have a near 50-50 breakdown. To answer more specifically, I think everyone needs to remember that Joe Biden served in the Senate for decades. He's I think almost certainly going to take an approach of um, trying to work with Republicans. You know, he knows a lot of them on uh, the Hill and they know him. I don't know whether he gives it six months or six weeks, but I think that's his inclination because Democrats always worry about, you know, what goes around, comes around, that if we do it now, you know, the Republicans will pack it with 93 judges the next time they have it. Um, but to go back a second, I, I think there's a, uh, a, a distinction to make between, like I agree with Tevi, it, talking about contested election and civil unrest is a bit of media catnip there. Uh, and the added uh, example I will I will put on is every four years, and I, I'm amazed it hasn't happened yet. Probably because the polling doesn't doesn't allow it, but also the possibility of a tie in the electoral college that's always a, a favorite. Um, you have to make a distinction between the noises that Donald Trump makes and the actual outcome in that, look, is Donald Trump going to say on election night, well, I had a, you know, it was a hard fought race and I called Joe Biden and told him, hey, you're the man. Probably not. But we don't change presidents the next day. We do so, you know, more than 60 days later. If it were an incredibly close election, Donald Trump would have the support of the Republican establishment and specifically the, uh, the Republican uh, majority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell. And that would be a much more serious thing. But I, I kind of, to the extent that I can channel Donald Trump, I think a lot of the noises he's making now are just excuses. He's setting up excuses for why 
if he loses, why it happened. So he can go through the rest of his life blaming ballots, blaming the deep state. It's not that he's going to take this to the bitter end, because as much as he has steamrolled over the process and institutional norms, th this would be a doozy. Uh, I would make one point, though, um, because... I worked for Gore in 2000, like I said, and I was actually in the National Archives the day that he decided to concede looking for something that the state of Hawaii had done or not done in 1960. And I've often thought about the two biggest, we've had two basically constitutional crises when it comes to the presidency in the last half century, Watergate and uh, Recount in 2000. Watergate um, and both men, Richard Nixon and Al Gore did quote the right thing. Richard Nixon, though he had committed whatever you want to call it, which is called a crime. He committed a crime, but he saw the writing on the wall. At the end of the day, he was going to abide by the decision of the court. And the reason that he resigned was because the court had just ruled against him in terms of what he had to turn over. Fast forward to 2000, Al Gore, who to this day believes that he sh should have been president, decided the court had spoken. The court had spoken in a way that he didn't think was fair. He didn't think was valid. He thought was incredibly partisan, but he accepted it. You have to imagine for a moment, plugging Donald Trump into either one of those situations. The idea that he would have done the, the quote, right thing in either of those situations is absurd. And it's why I keep coming back to, sure, we've had contentious times in our history we have often taken two steps forward and then one step back on whether it's racial relations or economic equality. And hopefully this is the one step back and we're gonna take two steps forward. But this is not 1860, this is not 1960. This is someone who single-handedly has really just upended society. Now, there are Republicans on this call, there are Republicans in the audience. If we disagreed about something, um, if, Someone said masks don't help. And I said, well, you know what? There's a study that says it does. Let's go to the internet and sit together and let's find this study that the Wall Street Journal reported on or the Associated Press reported on. We would probably come to a, a we would have a thoughtful conversation where minds would be changed. It is impossible now to have a thoughtful conversation with anyone on the Trump side, who supports Trump, not reasonable people like on this call, which who are the vast, vast, vast minority. If you support Donald Trump on this call, I'm assuming you don't believe that there's some global cabal of Democrats running a child trafficking ring. I assume you don't believe a lot of what he says, but you've got tens of millions of Americans who do, and they will not agree to any fact set. And that's the longest lasting problem that I think Donald Trump has left us. You cannot get anywhere if you can't even agree on any kind of, of foundation of, okay, this media outlet or this doctor or this scientist or this academic institution has said this, um, let's talk about it. You, it's gone. It, it, it just, and you know, I, I think a big part, of, what's funny is that we're talking about uh, civil discourse and um, divided country, it's very possible eight, nine days from now, we all feel better about America because it was not a close election. I uh, am not a typically glasses, has any water in it kind of person, but I do believe the polling can be, I'm not, I decided long ago that I'd rather be wrong twice than paralyzed by 2016. The polls could be very wrong now, but Joe Biden is going to win the popular vote by a fair amount, more than Hillary did uh, in 2016. And I don't know if he's going to win Texas. I don't know if he's going to win Georgia or Florida. I firmly believe he's going to win. I firmly believe he's going to win for the very simple reason that you don't need experts uh, on the phone. Donald Trump has done a bad job. And the, we have, in the last 80 years, we have fired three presidents uh, who wanted to serve a second term. Um, and it's because we thought they were doing a bad job or the situation wasn't getting better. So and I'd like to actually, um, Philippe, Ariel, I'm turning to you, just yeah. perhaps to address 
Philippe's points about um, Mr. Trump and the role he's played. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. Well, maybe I could begin with a slightly broader historical point. Um, which, so first, I do think, you know, like Philippe, the ability to process facts together is often the basis of civil discourse. And we're often get uh, hesitant with some current discussions is both the attribution that there's a mass phenomenon that is the disengagement from facts. And part of that is we don't often recall just how widespread conspiracy theories were throughout American history. We'll go all the way back to the founding and conspiracy theories about Britain, um, updating it more to, you know, say the 1890s conspiracy theories that driven by the people known as populists about banks and the Rothschilds, et cetera, who are really pulling the strings. But I think it, it's often most compelling to set it in something closer to the present and the extent of sort of uh, communist or anti-communist conspiracy theories, uh, the rise of the John Birch movement on the far right uh, in the 1950s, the belief that Eisenhower was a secret communist. And I think we, we can feel a little more at home. That's a time where people we know were alive at that time if we weren't ourselves. It's not remote. Um, and also it's important because it reminds us it's not about the internet or Twitter or Facebook, that conspiracy theories are embedded much more deeply in the way I think human psychology, I can't really speak, I don't speak as a psychologist, but a political scientist, but when you see how frequent they are, uh, you know, in foreign countries, you see the same things, the way they, they find their way around. And there's often an assumption now that well, there was a golden age of media serving as gatekeepers. There was an authoritative, more neutral media, and they prevented this. And I don't think that's true. And I think it's also important to couch it to some degree in that there is a, you know, without getting into the danger of both sides or you two, what about ism? Um, it's not just that Trump has pulled tens of millions of Americans away from believing in facts. There's a lot of this on both sides, you know, it, we don't talk about a lot, the belief that AIDS was made in a government laboratory uh, before it infected people. And even actually one great media gatekeeper like Dan Rather gave a surprising amount of promotion to that idea, which is pretty wild. And, you know, or the belief that 9-11 was an inside job, meaning America had a role in perpetrating it, was surprisingly prominent among those who voted against Bush, according to polls in 2004. So uh, I would just like to anchor that not in slipping into the sense that, oh, there's this unique phenomenon among Trump supporters of being distant from the facts. If we want to talk about the, the White House elite it's, and the way members of Congress behave, I think we can focus on that. But this partially goes to why I'm, I'm concerned about not judging people individually, um, which is that you get into this assumption that all people of a certain political persuasion are a certain way or deficient in their use of facts. And, I mean, with regard to the president himself, I, I have a harder time uh, defending some of those propositions that, um, I mean, I think there's there's a duality which is hard to capture, which is, um, you know, from the very beginning, Trump has talked about the fake news media. And, uh, you know, from my interaction with journalists, I've often found that they have a difficult time recognizing their own biases, especially the fact that you have a, a profession so heavily populated with liberal graduates of elite universities. And they, they have a lot of methods they employ to try to check facts, to rely on things. Um, and, and yet they want to always, uh, you know, maintain their position as they should. They should try to aspire to be even handed. And yet at the same time, they have in some ways followed Trump down the garden path of really not checking stories of letting things sort of classic things that are too good to be true. They still, you know, report them as true. Um, the Hunter Biden laptop case sort of is a great case study. I'm sure a whole book will be written about it someday that. It's, it's very easy to question the providence of this laptop that shows in a blind shows up in the computer shop owned by a blind repairman and then makes its way to Steve Bannon and Rudy Giuliani. But there really has been something of a blackout where the story, there's a sort of a sense that there's a responsibility now because of Trump to line up and sort of treat it as a non-story. Um, and I, I wish we could find out more to the truth of it. It's a dangerous high stakes moment. Everyone focuses on how James Comey's revelation about Hillary's computer probably had a significant swing associated with it in 2016. But there really is this problem both with those who don't respect the facts and those who appoint themselves and consider themselves the guardians of the facts who don't see their own biases. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause some of, uh, some of the direct politics and ask um, Nicole, I believe it's you who has a question that is of a more personal nature. Am I correct? Yeah. So I actually want to ask uh, all the panelists, 
How have your Jewish values shaped your political views? So let's start with Tevi. Great, thank you for that question, Nicole. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Look, I grew up in Queens in the 1970s. I did, commuted to Ramaz and, uh, in the early 1980s. And I looked around and I saw a city that was a big mess. And I saw a country that was having a lot of problems back then in the late 70s. And uh, you know, there's crime, there was graffiti, there was a horrible blackout in 1977. And I was from a family of uh, my parents uh, and grandparents who all came from Europe, as uh, many people on this call have as well. And they only survived because the ancestors made the decision to leave Europe and come to America. So I had a great sense of hakarat hatov, a great sense of gratitude for this country. And I was interested in joining politics because I wanted to see if I could help make things better. And I ended up going to Washington. I worked in think tanks and I've worked in the White House. I worked at, uh, I was deputy secretary at HHS. And it was all because I had this belief that if you weigh in and, and make uh, positive movements towards improvements and uh, towards policy reform, and you really think about these things, you can make things better. And I think that's a very Jewish value. And I think that informed my thinking when I was at the White House, when I was at HHS, and now today when I write about uh, public policy issues that continues to inform my thinking. So uh, I, uh, in addition to my Hakarata to, to this great country, and I think if more people had gratitude towards America and didn't look at America as a source of evil, but looked at America as a source of good, I think we all would be better off. But I also want to give a Hakarata to, to um to Ramaz and to Dr. Jacoby, who really helped uh, open my mind to uh, broader things and to uh, what the lessons we can learn from history are. So um, I think that's my answer to your question, Paul. That's why I turn to you first, Daniel. So my bar mitzvah parsha is Shoftim, and there's a there's a pasuk in there, tzedek tzedek tzedek. You know, you should always uh, pursue justice. Uh, some people talk about tikkun olam, but that's that's one that really sticks out for me, and there there. Are, really interesting examples in that parasha of, you know, a body is found murdered outside the, the gates of a city and, and it's in no jurisdiction. It's in no man's land. How do you determine who's responsible for it? And, and to me, that's kind of a metaphor for uh, feeling like, uh, you know, th there's nothing that we can just look the other way at and, and feeling like we as a society need to, to consider those things. And, and uh, look, look to, to make, uh, to, to, to view um, the problems and, and sufferings of, of individuals or, or of uh, uh, broader swaths of the population as our own obligation. I know that people who are on the more conservative side of the spectrum just have a very different perspective on how to tackle that. I think it was very interesting to hear, you know, Tevi growing up in uh, the 70s and 80s in, in New York City. Uh, I grew up, of course, in, 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 in the New Jersey suburbs, and I commuted into Ramaz. And at that time, sort of the, the crime issue um, and sort of the general issue of stability in New York was um, uh, that there was almost like a bipartisan consensus that some of the heavy-handed tactics that conservative uh, city leaders had used uh, were working. And um, the challenges of that period, you know, it, after 9-11 and, and after the financial crisis became more about um, whether America uh, could, could be uh, successfully, you know, police the world, quite frankly, you know, in, in an interventionist way, and uh, whether, you know, all the gains of the economy were going to a handful of people uh, who uh, had, had rigged the rules in their favor. And I think I was more shaped by the, those latter events and in, in terms of how I understand how to think about that setting, setting to your dope idea. Ariel, what is what are your uh, thoughts on how your Jewish values and Ramaz shaped you, if sure. at all? <laughs> so yeah, I do like. To, I want to offer a couple uh, caveats about the difficulty of that question. I do think, like Tevi said, it's a personal desire to serve that has a lot to do with the sense of obligation that is, that's anchored in Jewish values. Um, at the same time, um, Daniel mentioned tikkun olam, and I have seen what I feel is a problem in the Jewish community, uh, which is that tikkun olam is increasingly identified only with the policies of one party. It's the usual logic there is that whether it's immigration, welfare, healthcare, that uh, the proper way to help make the world a better place is to support the party that sees a more active role for government in tikkun olam. And um, 
on the you know on the other side, of course, what's interesting is that the same party or the same those of a progressive leaning who see Tikkun Olam as a government mission. Uh, maybe it's because of when, not in particular, I was at Ramaz. There was so much fear that a rising evangelical movement would impose its beliefs on the rest of America, and whether it was you know very difficult issues like abortion uh, or the proper way to you know respect treat homosexuality. Um, everyone was, was afraid of religious answers. And, you know, I think also going back into the, the history of the Jewish community, I think there's good evidence that, you know, in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, the organized Jewish community uh, worked very hard to increase the secularism, that we always felt as a community that the safest thing for us was to marginalize religion as much as possible uh, in public life, that the more, especially it meant the Christian majority, the more it gained power, there was a risk of sort of Christian-based anti-Semitism coming back. And I think there's been a response to that over time that, you know, the, the, the notion of separation of church and state is, is somewhat different than the notion of not having an established government church or synagogue. Um, and, and we should pursue balance and just avoid some of the simplistic answers when it comes to how we want to act on our Jewish values, how we try to, you know, bridge the gap between inspiration and doing. Thank you. I'm going to move very quickly now, I hope. There's a lot to get through. Philippe, you warned me of this, of course. But Philippe, what, what do you have to say in terms of that question? I'll just be quick. First, I can't top what they were saying. I would just say I've never felt more Jewish than I have in the last three and a half years. Um, and I actually... I kind of relish, you know, with the name Philippe, it's it's not like a lot of people peg me as Jewish. And I've just been very proud, but almost taunting. Like I, I very much like it when it comes up because I, it's been very easy being Jewish. Uh, like I grew up, I lived through the 1977 um, blackout too. And, you know, bad New York. And uh, I actually voted for Rudy, not just twice for mayor, but three times for mayor. And um, it's still easy to be a Jew, but it's easy to forget um, that it's not, that it can be hard to be a Jew. I know I'm talking very circular, but I, I feel there's, we're all under threat. And while in the scheme of things that we were going to rank religions or genders or races that thankfully um, as a religion we are not you know top five most under uh, threat but I, I do think it's been important to be mindful in a very specific way um, I don't I don't know how familiar anyone is going to be with the term either everyone will be or won't be but the thing that I that stuck in my mind the most since 1987 uh, has been Tudir, Shano Tudir, Tudir Kodam. And I've done that because I believe very much whenever I'm talking to younger people who aren't sure what to do or when I'm not sure what to do, I will, I will and to non-Jews, I will say that there is a concept of when there are two things, one that is scarcer or rarer has greater value. And um, it's just always funny in my head when I actually use the term and try to explain it. I use it, um, I have a, one of my closest friends is a Catholic from Alabama and he just loves when I use any Hebrew or any Yiddish and he can't, you know, and it's, he tries to repeat it and he gets the whole thing where he said, can't say, huh. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just been, it's just been proud. It's again, it's almost like I'm picking a fight um, when I want everyone to know that I'm Jewish now. Like I want if someone has something to say or if someone has a bias, um, I want to deal with it. Thank you. Uh, Yoav, do you have a question? You could address it to one of the um, panelists about the election issues themselves. I think you have some. Well, I thought all of them would uh, have a good answer to this, which is we've seen an unconventional style of campaigning, right? No big rallies. Um, no big political events, much smaller. How do you guys think that affected this race? Did it benefit somebody else? Did it give the American people to move the race that we might not have had? Has been a traditional um, sort of campaign. What do you guys think about that? Well, actually, I'm going to just ask one panelist, and that's going to be you, Kevin, to answer that question. Yeah, I saw this really fascinating quote in the New York Times this weekend where a journalist asked a senior member of the Biden team saying, who would have thought this basement campaign would be so effective? And the Biden advisor said, well, we did. 
So look, obviously it's working. And uh, I think what we've seen in American politics, and you look historically, there's always some new tactic that is employed that works that you didn't think was going to work. So uh, Trump used Twitter, I think, very effectively in 2016. Obama used Facebook in a way that had never been done before. Bush used micro-targeting in 2004. So when, when you have a successful campaign, it usually involves something that we haven't seen before in American politics, a new strategy, a new tactic, or sometimes, you know, with the basement campaign, it's kind of like the front porch campaign of the 19th centuries. Sometimes you repurpose an old tactic and you make it new again. So, um, you know, some people could say, uh, well, maybe Biden was around there for the 19th century, but, uh, you know, I don't want to get too much into the partisan stuff. But um, the, the, the fact is, that I think the Biden campaign has run a really effective campaign. We won't know for sure until next Tuesday. It seems to me that Biden is likely to win, win this race. Um, and even if he doesn't, the fact that he's been win running through the poll, winning via the polls throughout suggests that they, they know something about what, what they're doing. So uh, I, I don't think that the, uh, uh, the tactic's necessarily a bad one. Um, I do think I agree with Ariel that sometimes the media need to call them out. And um, it was interesting, the Leslie Stahl interview with um, Donald Trump and her first thing she says to Trump, well, I'm gonna be asking you tough questions. And he said, well, why aren't you asking Biden tough questions? And you're, it was a perfectly legitimate response in, in, in that sense. Uh, that doesn't mean everything he says is legitimate, but uh, I, I do think Biden has gotten uh, softer questions, but in some ways Biden by creating that buffer around him has created a space to let him get away with not getting the, the tougher questions. He's saying, look, this is the kind of campaign we're gonna run and the American people seem to like it. So again, uh, every successful American campaign has a new tactic or a repurposed old tactic. And uh, you know, as a historian, I find it fascinating to watch. We're gonna fit very few more questions in, but Ariel, it would be uh, uh, delinquent of me if I did not address this question that I had seen from Scott Glassberg. Hello, Scott. Um, the, in terms of, you know, we had a question about Jewish values. How do you regard President Trump's policies concerning what he says are his successes in terms of Mideast affairs? Has, has that, would you characterize it that way? Um, so I, I, let's narrow it just a bit so that maybe the question of Israel, the broader Middle East makes things very complicated. I think- You're we'll right, have... and I should have narrowed it. Yeah, I mean, we'd have a big dispute. I think Iran policy has moved mostly in the right direction, but there's a very sharp divide among experts on that. I think Syria policy has moved in uh, uh, multiple directions at once. But I think there should be no question, I hope, that three peace agreements or normalization deals between Israel and Arab states are remarkable things, right? We've had two in history. Um, there's been some pushback saying, well, Israel's making agreements with dictatorships, not with these peoples, but I don't recall anyone arguing about the agreements with Egypt or Jordan or the uh, autocratic Palestinian uh, liberation organization in 1994. I, I certainly do wish for greater democracy there. Um, and, you know, to what degree was that Trump or could someone else have made that happen? One of the popular answers is circulating where there's a video of John Kerry sort of at the height of his efforts to create a Palestinian Israeli agreement in 2013 and 2014. And, you know, he, he goes on with quite a bit with his glasses on his nose in a very imperious manner saying, no one in their right mind could believe that it's possible to have a deal with the Gulf Arab states and Israel before there's a solid agreement with the Palestinians. And, you know, history uh, ha had a little bit of a comeuppance for him. And, you know, it really is something we should celebrate and give credit where credit is due. I think there it's, you know, the team at the White House has done it. It's been a result of uh, Trump's strong support for the Gulf states, even when they've done some of the worst and most autocratic things they've done to their own citizens or neighboring citizens, because you have to make difficult trade-offs in foreign policy that perhaps a historic peace deal is worth uh, something like that. A and I hope we see more to come. So um, I, I hope that's, that's considered ably. Um, you know, other moves again, whether it was the embassy move, recognizing the Golan Heights, I think, we probably remember there was a lot of forecasts of doom, of widespread protests and violence, and they didn't materialize. So in some ways, I just I think this speaks to a deeper uh, liberal conservative divide on how we understand the Middle East. But I think ho hopefully we're all in the place where we celebrate uh, a peace deal for Israel. You once admonished me about my use of the term Arab street. <laughs> and, and you were right that time. Abigail, do you have a question? And then we're going to finish up. 
Um, okay, so we've talked about civil discourse and facts and if we can trust them. And I think over the years, distrust of the government and especially people who have been in politics for a long time has grown. So how do you think politicians can help restore our trust in the government? And like once we recognize that there's this distrust, how do we move forward? How do we move forward with civil discourse? Daniel, you get that one. Yeah, well, just one thing that I think hasn't really come up just yet is that the phenomena that we're seeing in the United States right now are occurring across uh, the Western world and to some extent across a wide range of other countries as well. If you, you know, count the Philippines, Brazil, and Turkey, certainly not uh, the Western world, but uh, in um, mature middle-class democracies, there is a crisis of faith and trust in government that, you know, if we were isolated to, again, those mature uh, middle-class democracies, it seems to be uh, based on uh, insecurity about, to some extent, globalization, uh, loss of traditional middle-class jobs to trade, and um, sort of competition for jobs with uh, a mass Im immigrant class, a political class that may have more in common with its counterparts in other countries than with its working class, poor and middle class, uh, less educated, less uh, cosmopolitan citizens in the interior of the country. And I would say that I think that this incivility that we're experiencing, notwithstanding that Donald Trump is really exceptional among the leaders of all these nations in, in terms of his uh, polarizing effect and I think callousness and selfishness, the, um, the in order to restore that civility, I think we, we need to solve some of these underlying problems, these underlying policy problems of large swaths of this country and also large swaths of other mature middle-class democracies feeling as though uh, they are not represented in our politics. And uh, personally, I favor an approach of, um, you know, sort of at least having, you know, one political party that, uh, are really both political parties that reflect uh, the concerns of uh, working class and poor people of all races more effectively. And that can mean, you know, a more nationalistic Republican party, and maybe it means a more socialistic Democratic party. And I, I really think that you cannot sever the issue of civility and the issue of the process from some of the fundamental policy phenomena happening here in the United States. And I think the same thing is probably true in the UK in France, in Germany, and elsewhere. I'm gonna start talking heavy. So I wanna echo a, a little bit of what Daniel was saying. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm torn between, of course, you know my own politics, but I'm torn between your notion of um, civility and the need for more centrist parties versus what Daniel was saying. I think that there's a lot to be argued in favor of parties that really represent some of those, I'm not gonna call them extreme. I'm gonna say we need perhaps a healthy left and a healthy right, maybe more than we need a vibrant center. What are, what are your thoughts on that? It, it, it's a good point, because look, you can wish for a third party as much as you like, and maybe uh, it would be nice to have a centrist party that uh, recognizes the benefits of uh, trade and uh, legal immigration, um, the kind of, uh, post uh, Cold War Clinton consensus, I guess. Uh, but the way American politics has been is the last 150 years is two parties. So we do need to figure out a way to um, get the, the two parties uh, more operational. I mean, I, you know, I was struck by something that uh, AOC said the other day or um, a while back she said, uh, I can't believe I'm even in the same party as Joe Biden in any other system, we wouldn't be in the same party. So I mean, there, are, there are real divides with, within both parties, and, and I'm not sure that these big umbrellas uh, represent what's actually going on. I think what happened in 2016 was you had a bunch of Republican establishment folks thinking that Trump will never win because we, the Republican establishment, reject him. And he went to the voters, and the voters seemed to be behind him and not behind the, the Republican establishment. There, there was a kind of thought among Beltway types, myself included, that you're never gonna have somebody who doesn't get that blessing from the, what have you, National Review, Wall Street Journal, uh, kind of uh, establishment conservative uh, hecture. Um, and, um, and that clearly didn't happen with Trump. 
uh, he went and he got the support. Now, he, you know, he got a third of Republicans behind him, but that was enough in a divided field to win. And then what was interesting was that retroactively, a lot of them then, uh, a lot of the so-called establishment came, uh, came in behind him. So um, I, I do think we, I would like to see uh, better, um, better uh, improved parties uh, with more rationality, although I, I do take Daniel's point that um, in times of upheaval, people look for uh, alternative types of solutions. Uh, but, uh, but I also would see, like to see if there's ways we can fix the center at the same time. Uh, thanks. I, I can't see who's here. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the guests, the audience, I, I'm just uh, been told that we have alum from all over the world. One of the things that I, I've remarked to some of you uh, uh, over the past few months is tragedy of the COVID crisis recognized, there have been remarkable recognition of opportunities that were there within the past few decades because of technology, but we just were not making use of them. And the, uh, the fact that we can have this kind of an assembly with the guests today and continue it afterwards, um, Mr. Rockland, you'll nod your head or you could even say, we just, we're not just not quite up to making use of it as soon as we might have. And now, we're, now um, it's available to us. It's great. And we will be making more and more use of it, please God, over the coming weeks. People will hear more about the things that we're working on, John, and that you're working on. So thank you. Um, so, you know, again, I welcome all the, all the people who've gathered here. Um, you, you spoke about the, you know, a few, a few months ago with my... Uh, uh, my child and my, I'm not sure she's going to remember it, my 13-month-old grandchild, uh, we went and visited Martin Van Buren's home up in the Hudson Valley. And I was giving them, because that's what I do, uh, on Napoleon's uh, birthday, I talk about Napoleon. On a visit to Martin Van Buren's home, I speak about the unspoken genius of American history. He uh, he invented really the idea of the modern two-party system. Uh, the idea that you actually cannot have national stability unless you have a national two-party system representing within each party, not just all the regions, but the entire spectrum. Philippe and Ario, when you were speaking about friendships and marriage, that's the sort of thing that's breaking down, no, Philippe? Well, you know, the historians, on the Zoom can answer this better, address it better. But what was interesting to me about 2016 was Hillary was the only establishment candidate. I don't mean that in a pejorative manner. Her uh, primary opponent was uh, someone who had registered independent, only changed uh, his party affiliation, Democrat, before he ran, and basically is self-identified socialist. Her general election opponent is someone who has changed parties seven times. And I don't just mean Republican, Democrat, but, you know, reform the whole nine yards. And just as an aside, I think it's important for the sake of this conversation to acknowledge that Donald Trump is not a particularly ideological person. He jumped into the Republican Party because his brand fit into that better. I think he could have just as easily. But the two-party system, and, and for a while before Super Tuesday, when it was looking like Bernie Sanders would be the nominee, that really would have brought uh, just a in, into sharp relief what you're talking about, the two-party system. In a way, you could argue the two-party system was sort of dead. But I think that there are unique problems within each. Um, and to go back to my, you know, sort of focusing on the right more, what I was surprised about after 2016 is, look, I, I work in government for over a dozen years. I'm not gonna sit around and say it's the best run organization or that it doesn't waste money. I don't believe it has any ill intent, but I, so I understood the notion of tearing it down or taking a wrecking ball to Washington in simplest terms. What I didn't expect was um, how many people would not feel a need to replace it with anything. And it's a problem going forward in that you have two parties, but one of the parties, a big chunk of it, and this is not a criticism, this is just a sort of ideological observation, 
you have a good chunk of the right being very dubious about government, about large government, the role of government, therefore a more um, suspect view of public servants. The left thinks the government can fix everything and therefore people who go into government are saints. Um, and it really manifests itself in a lot of different ways. I, I don't know, look, if, if Joe Biden wins, obviously it restores the Democratic Party, sort of the, the structure of it. Um, and if we can get back to the days of arguing left and far left, that's a good sign for the party. But I, I, I think the Republicans have to come to some kind of understanding or acknowledgement that Donald Trump didn't get anything done that Jeb Bush or Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio could have done. Um, and you were asking the question about Israel and obviously the, the peace deals are tremendously important. But the typical mantra of, well, I don't like Donald Trump. He's a blowhard, he's abrasive, he's divisive, but I like his judicial picks. I like um, that he has torn apart uh, regulation and I like tax cuts. None of those three things are particularly specific to Donald Trump. So there really has to be an answer as to why the Republican Party has felt the need to, to put the head of, to make the head of their party a human wrecking ball that does not feel a need to replace what he destroys with something more constructive with really no return on investment. If Donald Trump had done something just supremely unique and wonderful. You can make the argument that the ends justifies the means. I have, the question I have is what do Republicans think that they got out of Donald Trump that was worth, first of all, the last four years, just the sheer service of the last four years, but also putting their own party on the brink of splintering of uh, an upheaval that is, you know, there are many Republicans who think the party's just going to bounce back to the way it was. And, and that's just magical Think It's not going to happen. And I don't know how, um, and I, I don't know the percentages. I don't know if it's 10% of the Republican Party or half of the Republican Party, but I don't know how those two parts reconcile. And for as long as the wrecking ball part of the party is so influential in picking its candidates, particularly um, their 2024 candidates, I don't know how there's uh, a successful two-party system. To me, it's almost like it should be the Israeli parliament. Like you're going to have these never Trumpers break away and be the, you know, the ultra ultra orthodox sect that tips the balance between who has the majority in parliament. Um, so this, but this leads actually perfectly to one of the questions that just got posted. Uh, I'm not sure, Ariel, if you recall the name Ben Laywall. Uh, um, I run into him once in a while. I saw his uh, great interview in the New York Times. Uh, right. How often do you have a personal consultant on something like that? Okay, so Ben, um, always the empathic person, is concerned about if there is a, and, he, and he's assuming that there will be a Trump loss, what's in store for the large cohort of talented people note the modifier, like Mr. Adesnik, who opposed Trump. Um, so first, let me say hi to Ben and the other uh, class of 1995 alums. I see a whole lot listed on the participation roster. Um, I look, I guess we certainly didn't have a 25th reunion this year, um, but it's always a pleasure to see you, whether on Facebook or any other. We're working uh, on it. We're working on it. You've, you're going to inspire it even more. We're working on it. Okay, great. So yeah, and no, I, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Ben is a, a distinguished physician. So that, that was the uh, gluten reference and really is an expert on it. Um, and so, you know, what is the future? You know, I, I think a lot of discussions I've heard among uh, people sort of lays out a number of different scenarios. I mean, one that would be fairly obvious is that if Trump wins, uh, those who have been saying that sticking with him is a terrible idea are going to look pretty silly. Now, you can still say there's a matter of, uh, well, you stood on principle, and in the end, that's what it came down to. Um, it didn't have, there wasn't too many opportunities to pursue by pointing your finger at your own party and saying it has problems. 
Um, but of course, just the political logic would be simple. Uh, if Trump somehow pulls out a victory, um, I think it would cement his legacy in, in a unique way, and there would not be a lot of uh, interest in hearing from those who doubted him. Um, the most difficult might be a, a very close election, where when an election is very close, um, anything that might have swung the polls by a point or two uh, is something that you could say plausibly caused the election to turn out the way it did. And there will be a lot of fingers saying, well, we knew you were never all that influential. We knew you were marginal carping voices, but you guys, you may have turned uh, one percent of the American voters against this party. And you're the ones, you know, the only reason Trump couldn't win and unite this country is because you wouldn't go along with it because of, you know, sort of, you would say your ego trip. And of course, sort of the third scenario is a fairly decisive Biden win, um, or even one, you know, what would be a landslide? Uh, the only, the last time a candidate lost by double digits was Walter Mondale. And you don't see a lot of Democrats remembering the good old days of Walter Mondale and lamenting that uh, he couldn't have succeeded. Uh, and so I think what would happen is you would still have to see a major reckoning that it's only a, a sort of an overwhelming kind of result that would lead, I think, the party as a whole to question if the Trump style was a problem, regardless of how we assess the achievements. So, I, I don't think I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Coming. Yeah. Sorry uh, for taking too long. No, no, no. Actually, Dr. Take... Dr. Jacoby, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, sure. So, I, I, I've gotten to know some of the you know, so-called never Trumpers pretty well, including uh, Kellyanne uh, Conway's husband, George Conway. He and I palled around a little bit, which is more than a little odd. Um, <laughs> first of all, they, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for what they did. They've all suffered personally and professionally and probably not coming back to that. Their life's not gonna just revert to the way it was. If Donald Trump loses, no matter how decisively it's in some ways defeat by a thousand cuts. And I think while it would be hard to assess how many, especially the Lincoln Project, the, the formal group of people who have tried to oppose and defeat Donald Trump, um, I think that they should uh, deserve, they should be given credit. The problem is the left wants nothing to do with them. The left is gonna go back to saying, well, you know, it's Mitt Romney is the perfect example, you know, because Mitt Romney hasn't, adopted Medicare for all, he's, uh, he's useless, um, as opposed to, you know, people doing what they can. I would say that just is on a very practical level, you know, one of the things that in 2016 struck me that's going to happen again next week is, look, Donald Trump's going to lose, um, but Lindsey Graham might win, and Susan Collins might lose, and, and that's, that sets a tone um, going forward, that there was no real cost to embracing Donald Trump. And look, Jeb Bush could run in 2024. He's not going to get anywhere. You could have another sort of Mike Pompeo, Tom Cotton, uh, you know, fire breathers who are going after it. So that I don't see the Republican Party becoming particularly, um, you know, open arms for people who who, who left because there's still going to be a chunk of the establishment that can't afford to antagonize this Trump base that's not going. I mean, let's be honest, no matter what happens next week, more than 50 million people are going to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, this is a sizable chunk of the country that um, is not just going to open their arms for Rick Wilson and Tom Nichols and Bill Kristol and George Conway to come on back to their think tanks and their magazines and their consulting. I, I recall the old slogan from 64, I think it was 27 million can be, must be right, must be right about Barry Goldwater. Um, Sarah, and Sarah, I don't know what last name Sarah that is, asked a great question. I wish the students could have heard this too. Tevi, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the Jewish community, Sarah asserts, largely is a two-issue voting block, taxes and Israel. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's an accurate assessment? And if so, well, take it from there. Yeah, I don't know if I'd buy that, that, uh, that the Jewish community is such an Israel-based uh, voting block. Um, I don't see evidence that uh, they vote just on, on the Israel issue. 
And uh, Bill Crystal, whom Philippe just mentioned, said that uh, the Jewish community cares more about uh, abortion than they care about Israel. So I, I just don't buy that. I do think that the um, Jewish community is kind of dividing in interesting ways. It used to be um, a hard and fast rule of American politics that the Jewish community voted 70, 80 percent for the Democratic candidate. And I think that's still true. But it used to be across the board. And now it's 80 plus percent of the reform and conservative Jewish community vote for the Democrat, whereas the Orthodox community, which is smaller currently, but growing demographically, votes in higher numbers between 60 to 80 percent for the Republican candidate. Uh, and um, I got to say, I was part of this in 2004 when we realized that um, George W. Bush wasn't going to get anywhere with the uh, reform and conservative Jews. Maybe we made a, an effort to focus on more, more on Orthodox Jews, although not exclusively on Orthodox Jews. I think now we see with the Trump campaign, they only focus on Orthodox Jews, it seems. And that's the, their real focus. I've seen polls that uh, show Orthodox support for Trump as high as 83 percent. I don't think it's that high, but, but it, it's definitely a majority. And um, I, I think it's, um, it's going to be a further divide in the American Jewish community in the years ahead because they're not only uh, disagreeing on uh, religious practice, but they're more e extensively disagreeing on politics as well. Uh, so those, those two issues have become rationalizations. So, so historically, I think Kevin is just nailed on the head that it's over, an oversimplification. But I think there are a lot of people who identify as Republicans who are Jews who, you know, the standard, I don't like Trump, I don't like how he acts, but he's great on Israel, but great on taxes. So it's not necessarily that those are their top two or that it's only those two. It's that, you know, everyone latches on to their, to their rationalization as to why he is palatable, or why he was worth it. And it, it does come down to those, those two things. Yeah, I just want to add one quick thing to that, which is the reason Trump supports Israel, not because he's trying to win over the Jewish community or the, the very small percentage of 500,000 Orthodox Jews in the country. He's doing it because I don't like to say the evangelicals, that's part of it. But Israel is one of the few unifying event, uh, one of the few unifying issues in the Republican Party. If you go up and down the line, Republicans tend to be supportive of Israel. Uh, taxes is another one of those issues or regulations. So uh, by finding in a time of a divided Republican Party that's very divided on issues like uh, trade and like immigration, uh, he's focusing on a couple of issues that are things that are unifying with the Republican community, Jews or non-Jews. Technically speaking, I think all 10 of his grandchildren are Jewish, not just the Kushner kids. Well, there was that joke in uh, 2016 that was going around, what's the difference between uh, Trump and his Jewish critics, which is Trump has Jewish grandchildren. <laughs> Uh, I thought grandchildren love their grandparents. Uh, oh, 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 okay, I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Ilya Grzowski, hello, Ilya, um, asked the question, and Daniel, I'm going to address this to you first. Would you be in favor of uh, continuing civil and criminal proceedings or, or uh, against the former President Trump, if that is the case, that he becomes formally president? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be in favor of it because I'm in favor of, uh, I think, a justice system that treats the crimes of the powerful with equal weight to the crimes of the powerless. And I think currently we have uh, a system that does the opposite. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about the Mueller investigation, which, of course, I fully admit uh, revealed that, that, Trump, that there's no hard evidence of Trump colluding uh, with the Russian government, was that seemingly every every person in Trump's inner circle is guilty of some you know unrelated financial crime? You know when you look at a figure like Paul Manafort and his tax evasion, and to me what that represented was just that white collar crime is actually ubiquitous. And uh, since um, you know in some ways since the Enron prosecution, very few uh, corporate criminals have have gone to to jail or, or prison for their crimes. Uh, you look at the 2008 financial crisis when we believe there was massive fraud and only one mid-level um, Credit Suisse executive ever did time. Uh, Kareem Sarageldin is his name. It's an interesting trivia point. So uh, that, would, that would be my wish uh, because it sure looks like independent of all the sort of stuff that get, gets liberals whipped up into kind of a, 
a lather uh, that he probably has done things in the financial arena that that at least deserve investigation. Um, I suspect it won't occur. I suspect that, uh, well, or at least I should say, I suspect it won't occur at the federal level. I don't think that Joe Biden has an appetite to relitigate that through his Department of Justice. But I do think that uh, in New York State, you could be looking at things like um, tax evasion issues. There were, there were also issues of, you know, uh, under assessing or over assessing the values of his properties and for insurance purposes and under assessing them for tax purposes. I mean, this is a guy who, uh, you know, has a privately held organization. Uh, he's never, so his, his books have not had to, been, to be this transparent. They still aren't that transparent because he hasn't abided by our four decade long tradition of, you know, revealing his personal tax returns. Um, so, uh, I think we could, we could see some stuff at the state level, but, um, and I, and I don't honestly know, you know, whether he's, you know, one of the things that he always said about, from what we do know about his taxes, right, about it, his federal personal income taxes, that he's paid $750, you know, a, a lot of that stuff is just, uh, what you can get away with within the bounds of the law. And, and, you know, though I, I think it's incredibly unfair as a journalist that, I pay a whole lot more in personal income taxes. Uh, that's uh, something where you need a legislative change and not a judicial ruling. Well, it's a notably highly paid profession. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm going to go against type and answer, I don't think he should be prosecuted. Of all the people I would have expected not to hear that answer, you may just, be. Just, just be done with it. Yeah. This can't be every Israeli prime minister being locked up after the fact. So but Daniel's quote, right. This is going to be a matter of New York uh, yeah. Attorney General. To quote an earlier time period, uh, you would say, let the long national nightmare be over. Um, I mean, if it's something terribly egregious, sure. If it's lying to Deutsche Bank about the value of uh, Trump Plaza. But an incident in Times Square you would prosecute. I mean, if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue, I think Fifth it's Avenue, important. I'm sorry, I got Yeah, the, I mean, if, I got, it would be important to note that he shouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, All right. Um, oh, but, but, but back to the personal uh, for a <laughs> moment. The, I happen to have uh, in front of me four illustrious alum involved in national politics who are men. What... What is the world that you're involved in uh, now in terms of you know, gender relations, gender opportunities? It used to be back in the 1940s, 50s and earlier, a male dominated world. Has that changed substantially? Or I assume that male? question is not to me considering I've worked for women for, uh, for two right. decades. That's, 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 <laughs> if, anything, I've, if anything, I've been held back as a as a white male, so okay. Um, <laughs> and what about what what about your experience, uh, Ariel? Sure, it's very much a live issue. Um, you know, given that I work on the national security and foreign policy side of things, and there's sort of pipelines into there from the military, from law enforcement, uh, from other areas, uh, it remains a field that, regardless of which where one is in the political spectrum. Uh, there seems to be a lot more men than women. And so there's uh, an awareness that there has to be uh, open pathways for everyone to have a chance. Um, and, and the question is, how do we achieve that? Um, you know, the military has a lot of work to do in a way of treating women fairly. Um, I think we've seen especially some of the incidents in the Navy where women have really been abused by superiors um, and not, you know, other services as well. Uh, I, I don't know if even if the military, uh, you know, really managed to address that thoroughly, we see anything like a 50-50 you know, split in the armed forces. And it's, of course, it's always going to be those, usually the officers and the ones who have are senior officers that then move on to influential national security roles. Um, I'd say in contrast, in a place like Capitol Hill, there's definitely much more openness um, in the, because young people can come in and rise very quickly and make a name for themselves. So when I deal with the staff of the Senate and House Foreign Affairs and Foreign Relations Committees, more likely uh, to see women. Um, I think there's slow uh, increase in the number of think tanks um, in a number of influential uh, politically appointed positions. 
Um, I think there's a gender gap. So you've seen uh, women rise up more in those ranks on the, the, you know, the Democratic side, although, of course, it was, you know, Condoleezza Rice, who in a way became the most prominent woman in foreign policy uh, on the Republican side. And just more broadly, um, you know, Me Too had a very big impact, uh, I think like it did in just about every other sphere, um, every other kind of employment. People are now are just much more attuned to the fact that even if you show proper courtesy and fairness to your female colleagues, uh, sometimes and incidents have come out where, you know, organizations had to deal with it. Others may not have been upholding those same standards we have expect of them. Um, so there's work to do. Uh, Tevi, you, uh, you have to rush off, I know, so I wanted to make sure you got a chance, if possible. Look, um, I, I think we're seeing a, a lot of uh, more involvement of women in all aspects of American life. I was surprised to see Ramaz do a manal. I did not expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not one who uh, has the policy of refusing to be uh, on a manal. I know there are, at the NIH, for example, they have a, a rule that you can't participate in, in one. Uh, but, but I think it's up to the event organizers to, uh, you know, to, to find the right people for, for whatever event. I will say as someone who's in healthcare, um, there's no dearth of women in healthcare on the think tank space or in the um, medical space. So um, uh, look, American uh, history has been one of integrating uh, new folks uh, from different uh, genders and different uh, demographic groups uh, throughout our history. It doesn't always happen at the pace that everybody wants it, uh, but, but it, it happens and it can, will continue to happen. You know, I'm reminded of um, my old Richard Hofstadter um, readings, and, I, and I, I'm just, I'd be curious to find out if there is, in fact, a gender gap of a different sort, Ariel, between uh, the numbers of women in healthcare think tanks and work versus, let's say, foreign affairs. Uh, just you know, throwing that out as something that might be a possibility, because, you know, Hofstadter spoke about such things in terms of professional choices. Daniel, what about you? Uh, your experiences, observations? About gender relations? Yeah. Uh, so at HuffPost, we're, I think, more than 60% women. And I've only ever worked for uh, women editor. Well, uh, maybe I had like one guy. and uh, But the editors in chief have always been women. I think one thing that we're struggling with and you know, other workplaces are struggling with is uh, sort of ways for it to be more reflecting of the racial and ethnic uh, demographic balance in the country. And of course, there's a debate over whether that's the kind of thing that can be uh, crafted artificially at the end of a process, you know, rather than at society's root. And, uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that this is, uh, I, it, what Ariel said about Me Too, you know, we, we've all uh, been more conscious and, and sensitive about uh, even the way things can be interpreted unintentionally, so. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Felna, could you give me a, a screen share rights for a moment? I have uh, Most a Most certainly. Yeah. Dr. Kobe, I think it's also worth noting the, the impact, uh, you know, once we're through this immediate period of of our history, women are going to deserve credit for saving us. I mean, from the moment Trump was inaugurated, um, women saved the day in 2018, not just voting, but women candidates. And I think next week, it's going to be another election probably determined by, by women. Uh, I was sad, as much as I respect and like the vice president, I was hoping there'd be a, a woman nominee to just continue on um, the progress that, that Hillary had made in 2016. But women's impact politically on the nation is, uh, I think it's higher than any other group, certainly men, as it should be. We <laughs> had that <laughs> pretty badly. Yes. Um, okay, I have screen sharing rights. I'm going to get this ready in preparation for our next question. You have yearbook photos of us? What are you planning to spring on? <laughs> no, something innocuous. I, I checked it out beforehand. Okay, let's see, here we go. Recognize this guy? 
Doctor. But isn't it true that the IRS has said that there's no intent no, I, to cure the experts, taxes? The experts say that that's not what you do. My people tell me, my lawyers tell me, my experts, they tell me that that is malpractice. And that's not what's going to happen. But look, your, your tax returns don't show anything. Your financial disclosure forms, I mean, have you seen mine? I, I Mine are like this high. You see more for my, and I've disclosed more about my finances than any person who's ever run for a president at all. But isn't it true that the IRS Let me has just said get that off that. No, I, to the experts, the Hold experts on. say that that's not what you do. My uh, people tell me, my lawyers tell me, my experts, they tell me. There we go. Stopped it. Philly? Tevi, Tevi does a hell of an impersonation. Oh, <laughs> yeah? Tevi, go ahead. <laughs> I'll pass on that for now. You're going to pass it. I want to, I want to see a clip of that. So, um, Philippe, you've got a career on SNL. You know, if uh, Alec Baldwin ever goes down, I can be the understudy. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, what was what was what was the experience like? It was and, the and, and let me actually be even a little blunt too. Did <laughs> did it work? The, yeah, the, I mean, there's a tendency when someone loses an election to say everything they did was bad and wrong. Um, you know, I'm going to, for the sake of time and uh, just acknowledge that Donald Trump won and not get into Jim Comey and all other things, but he won by uh, less than 1%, in fact, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 in two of the three states. I don't think uh, it is plausible to make an argument that Hillary did not win the debates in any kind of quantitative way. As it's just a pure anecdote, I can tell you that the front page of the New York Times on top of um, it being first women elected, their front page, had she elected, would have been uh, the debates are what made the difference. If you look at any kind of polling, they were neck and neck before the first debate, and it just kept opening after the three. You know, you take for granted, we watch TV, and look, we've been talking about them for uh, an hour and a half. They're never together. And when Hillary and, and Trump got on stage that first time, that was the second debate, when they get on the first time, Hillary couldn't remember the last time she saw him. She thought it might have been 10 years earlier at his wedding. Um, and it just seemed when you see those two people together, whether it's uh, Trump and, and Hillary or Trump and Biden, it's the, it's the starkest contrast you're going to see of the two people of the choice you have. And people seem to like what they saw of Hillary. I mean, polling showed that Republicans thought that she won. They didn't like her anymore than they did. They weren't going to vote for her. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was important. I'll tell you, this in twenty, the end of 2014, November of 2014, the first time that Hillary got the team together and said, um, it was after the midterms, and she said, look, I'm thinking about running, you know, that what would it look like? And at one point she said, you know, I really think it's going to come, if I'm the nominee, I think it's going to come down to the debates. I think people just want to see how I can handle myself against the man. And, you know, kind of went in one ear, not the other when she said it, but she was right. Um, and I'm sorry, but for Jim Coney, she would be president of the United States. And I think those debates would be uh, a big part of it. And part of it was that she practiced and she took it seriously. And, um, you know, the only two people in the world who know how tough debating Donald Trump is, it's Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. And Joe Biden at least had the benefit of seeing what happened four years ago, but Hillary was in, you know, this was new territory. I mean, if the best she had was me dressing up and flailing my arms around, um, <laughs> that's not exactly the best batting practice, you know, for, for a debate, but it let her kind of visualize it and experience it. And I think in a lot of ways I was worse than he was. I, I invite everybody to um, go to Philippe's Twitter account and watch him chasing Hillary Clinton around the room, <laughs> trying to hug her. Um, uh, Tevi, you have, this is, this is like the kind of question that they often ask at the end of a debate. Uh, and that is, can you share an anecdote, a personal anecdote from your career in politics that you think would be really fascinating that we get to hear something like that from somebody who's in, in the know at the centers of power. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. First, I want to, um, you, you made a joke about our yearbook photos. I want to share my yearbook photos I happen to have on my phone. And um, 
kind of funny that the two T's in front of me are the two T's from Trump Tower. There are these two gigantic br brass T's in Trump Tower in the late 1980s. I, mean, I had no idea the guy was going to be president someday, but uh, uh, my friend Alan Rekshaven thought it'd be funny to take my yearbook picture there, and, that, and that's what we did. So I thought that was kind of entertaining. Uh, look, I, um, I, I, maybe I'll talk about um, uh, debate prep, because Philippe was just talking about debate prep. I, I think debates are incredibly important. And I think they do help uh, determine who wins the election for better or for worse. I mean, and it's not, we're not electing someone who's the best debater, but we tend to, to elect somebody who does well in the debates. And I did debate prep in 2004 for Bush and Cheney. And one thing I noticed was that uh, Bush uh, wasn't really that interested in doing the hard work of the actual stand-up debates like uh, Philippe uh, participated in where uh, you, know, you, you stand there in character for an hour and a half. Um, but Cheney was, and uh, I sat there 10 times with Cheney as he did those debate preps. And I was the guy, I prepared the books, the, prepar the preparation books with all the material that you have to master. And I would correct him on the numbers, you know, the unemployment number, number went down by X or the uh, people, the graduation rent, uh, rate went up by Y. And uh, at one point uh, we had a break and he said to me, how do you remember all those numbers? And I said, when I was a kid, I used to get baseball cards and I'd remember, I'd memorize the statistics on the back. And his face lit up in a way that I never saw his face light up in the entire time I, I dealt with him when I was in the administration I was in for all eight years. And he said, you know, I used to do that when I was a kid too. I was a big fan of the uh, Cincinnati Reds and I would memorize their baseball cards. And I just thought it was a very humanizing moment that you, you look at these people as, you know, they're running the world and they're in charge of everything, but they're all just people. And uh, they all, you know, put their pants legs on if they uh, wear pants uh, one leg at a time. And, uh, uh, and, and I think it's important to remember that. You just... You've just made me discover that I share something profound with Dick Cheney. You're a Reds fan or a baseball fan? Baseball card fan. I'm a Giants fan. Ariel, uh, personal anecdote from your years in political work? Um, I don't think I've been in the room where it happened to the extent perhaps that Philippe and Terry have. I'll just share something um, more recent, which is that um, my daughter was at the same Jewish summer camp as the president's granddaughter a couple years ago. Mm. And um, it's, they got to know each other. And my daughter was seven then and still was not so politically aware. She had already uh, absorbed some views of the president, but we never told her that Arabella Kushner had any relationship to uh, the president. Although there was a mutual friend who had to be reminded by uh, some camp leaders that he should not bring up his political concerns about the administration with the president's granddaughter. And um, it's interesting, the lines that have been there, um, you know, obviously those kids go to school at a, you know, in a Jewish school in our community. And, you know, sometimes I don't think the approach has always been the most welcoming to them. And uh, then more recently, I heard my daughter and her friend who was also at the camp talking about that. And they, they agreed very quickly, you know what? I don't think that we should, you know, because they, they, they later discovered who Ar Arabella's grandfather was. You know, she was really nice. We shouldn't judge her according to who her grandfather is. And um, I think at least they were able to make that distinction. And I also reminded them that had uh, my daughter, had any of her grandfathers uh, been president, I assured her that most of the America would feel exactly the same way. Uh, <laughs> okay, and Daniel. Personal anecdote from your years, of, your years of lobbying, writing, working the, the, the politics. Yeah, so I, I was debating whether I would give uh, one of my anecdotes about the weird heterodox views of, of voters that you and I discussed. But I think, uh, you know, I had an experience, people always ask me, uh, you know, I would interview Bernie Sanders uh, a fair amount over the couple of years. And, uh, People ask me, you know, what, what's he like? What's he like? I said, you know, a lot of times people admiringly, and I would say, well, you know, eh, he's better, you know, he's better from afar. He, he really likes the people. He doesn't really love people, you know, that, that sort of a thing. And I was interviewing him about his single payer health care bill in 2017, and he said, we've got a guy who manufactures picture frames. He's a business owner, and he supports Medicare for all. And I said to him, uh, well, it's kind of funny, right? You're a socialist and uh, you're, you're trotting out a, a business owner to, 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 you know, cheer on your Medicare for all bill. He said, excuse me? 
What about 28 million people uninsured is funny to you? Do you think that's funny? <laughs> and and I, I said, uh, no, I, I was noting an irony. He's like, you know, he, so he didn't have the Far, uh, foreign humor. language. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> but I think we see from that that Daniel's the one who could do the imitations, not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that that's, you know, if, if Mr. Rockland, uh, we should do a session of impersonators. Maybe it turns out that we've got a program. <laughs> similar panel. Um, thank you, everybody. We still have quite a number of participants who stayed on. Thanks so much for all of you who came. Rebecca Tobin just wrote something. Good to see you. Quotation marks, Rebecca. Uh, all right. Thanks, all. Thanks for your thank time. You Debbie, you, so you didn't leave. It was so much fun. I couldn't break away. Okay, great. <laughs>